I am so pleased to welcome Jack Livings to discuss his new book, The Dog. This debut collection takes the reader across wide thematic swaths of contemporary China, exploring the culture through many different perspectives. This book stand out, stands out in its ability to capture the landscape as an observer instead of an outsider, and is heavily invested in its characters as well as what they stand for. Mr. Living's stories have appeared in many publications, including the Paris Review, Tin House, and A Public Space. Tonight, he's joined in conversation by Adam Kushner, editor of the Washington Post's new digital magazine, Post Everything. Please join me in welcoming them to Politics and Prose. thought it would be more official if I stood at the podium. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I'm going to read a little bit uh, the beginning of a story called The Air. Um, the only thing that I would say about it, <coughs> excuse me one sec, so as not to confuse, um, I refer to the Public Security Bureau, which is the police, essentially, as the PSB. Uh, and sometimes I refer to them as singular PSB or plural PSB. I just say PSB either way. And I don't want anybody to be confused because they, the PSB play a prominent role in this story. So I'll just read you the beginning of it. It's called The Air. <clears throat> there once had been a time Omar looked forward to fighting the Chinese the way he looked forward to a good meal or sex. But lately, he'd been letting his men take care of the dirty work. He could no longer bear the awful smell of the Chinese, their coarse gestures and smacking lips. To make matters worse, everyone was plotting against him. His own people were working with the Chinese to engineer his downfall. He was sure of it. Even Bola, the Mongolian henchman so stupid he hardly knew his own name, had made a play for the old gangster's throne. Not to expect treachery from his men would have been to display a gross misunderstanding of human nature, and Omar wasn't anyone's fool, but he had begun to question his ability to defend himself from their plots. Some of his men would cut their own mother's throats. Omar ran the west end of the Ganjako market, which was known as Uyghurville. There, the, crowd, the crowded market stopped abruptly at an invisible line on the road. Chinese there, Uyghurs here. From the Chinese side, it was possible to look into Uyghurville and see a few shirtless men tending pit ovens outside the mutton and noodle restaurants, old people moving slowly and without intent down the pockmarked road, expats looking to score hash. Bicycle tires and old shoes lay strewn across the roofs of the low buildings. Curtains of acrid stream poured from the paper plant at the neighborhood's edge. Farther west, the poorest of the poor had slung tarps at the feet of massive hills of garbage. Uyghurville was unquestionably the worst place in the world, and it remained perched on the edge of oblivion by a mix of swindle and violent refusal to submit to the Chinese city surrounding it. For years, residents of Beijing would not go there for fear of being robbed or killed. There had been uprisings and bombings. The Public Security Bureau, a paramilitary force known for its enterprising use of torture as a public relations tool, regularly conducted sweeping acts of bruta brutality in Uyghurville. Old men disappeared only to reappear months later with weeping stumps for legs. Women were destroyed with lead pipes. In some circles, there was discussion of who had struck first, but no one involved in the fight cared one way or another. The violence advanced and receded like floodwaters. Then Omar struck a deal with the PSB officer in charge of minority control. In exchange for monthly advisory fees, the PSB would publicly declare the neighborhood rehabilitated and safe for commerce. Uyghurville hosted a ceremony with ethnic dancing and speeches touting a new era of progress. Chinese cadres, like lions at the kill, hunched over meals of spicy lamb. Later, Uyghur girls were brought in. Though the cadre's eyes lit up at the sight of that prim primitive flesh, only a few partook, and the rest thought them perverse for doing so. 
For a while, everything ran smoothly. PSB officers walked the beat, and the neighborhood attracted the faddish attentions of Chinese bohemians, the children of high-ranking officials, the first wave of Chinese entrepreneurs. Expats hung around the noodle and mutton places smoking with the kitchen boys. The restaurants kept up their monthly payments, and almost overnight, the atmosphere of menace began to lift. But it wasn't long before the deal started to unravel. The cadres were swept up in a corruption scandal and replaced with a new band of bureaucrats, who as their first order of business doubled the protection fees, reasoning that since they had been clever enough to survive the scandal, they were worth twice as much as the morons who'd been kicked out of office. This sort of Chinese logic made Omar want to shoot himself in the head. On this point alone, Omar and his grandson saw eye to eye. The Chinese were pigs. No amount of money could make up for the defilement they heaped on the Uyghurs. At one point, the government had welded the neighborhood's manhole covers in place and diverted the sewers when the PSB discovered that gangsters were using the tunnels as, a as escape routes. Consequently, shit ran in the streets and Uyghur children died from diseases. Only Omar and a few others had proper homes. The Chinese robbed everyone blind, and no one could save enough to improve his lot. They lived like animals, sleeping in their noodle shops, atop laminate tables. At night, the floors be belonged to the rats. Omar ordered the restaurants to stop making payments. The Chinese were already bleeding them dry. Soon, the PSB patrols thinned, and the neighborhood began to decay again. There were rumors the Chinese had marked Omar for death. People joked that it was better not to stand too close to Omar in case an inept Chinese sniper had been assigned to the case. With him out of the picture, the Chinese could bulldoze the neighborhood and put up skyscrapers. There was no question about that. The land was worth something, even if the people weren't. It was with dark pleasure that Uyghurville's residents repeated the gossip about Omar. He wielded absolute power over the neighborhood, and for that they blessed him, feared him, and wished him dead all in the same breath. He was famously vengeful, and he had a long memory. Once, a Kazakh had brushed against Omar's wife in the market. The man apologized profusely, prostrating himself, delivering gifts in the following days. It's nothing, Omar had said. He waited 10 years to pour hot lead down the Kazakh's throat. In the meantime, he did business with the man, ate at the same table, shared the pipe. The Kazakh had come to feel that he could depend on Omar. This was how Omar operated. He took the long view. By summertime, the rumors that had simmered for months were being served up as fact. Omar was as good as dead. He didn't pay them any mind. There was always something in the air. Every night, Omar took a walk, as much to assure the neighborhood that he was very much alive as to survey his domain. He wore large square sunglasses, a blindingly white skull cap, patent leather shoes. On this particular night, he was engulfed by a double-breasted suit that hung on him like a hospital gown. A small velvet bag filled with his enemy's gold teeth chattered in his pocket. His capos travel, trailed behind him, and behind them, a few little boys, like gulls in the wake of a garbage scow, worrying the men for betel nuts. The sun had dropped beneath, between the paper plant's stacks, tinting the sky the color of a bloody wound. A hot wind pressing down from above flooded the street with steam. Despite the PSB pullout, the restaurants were packed on this hot summer night, the streets swarming with Chinese, Uyghurs, expats, shady-looking in-betweens. See, Omar thought, it's worked out fine. When he passed by, the wranglers who pulled in customers kept up their patter, come, come, but maintained a respectful distance. Foreigners and Chinese stared openly at this slice of local flavor the crowd parting to allow him passage. Near a pile of trash at the edge of the neighborhood, Omar passed by some off-duty PSB. They were young and stiff, swallowed by their green woolen uniforms, and absolutely terrified of this place, which lay between their station and the dormitory where they lived. Only through great restraint did they manage to keep from holding hands, as some officers would have done. Two had reached a compromise, and walked with their arms locked at the elbows. It was obvious they were only kids, but Omar never let them out of sight. Children always ran the revolutions, 
And in the old days, these animals would have worked him over with their clubs. He knew they had a nose for his blood. Sure enough, as they passed by, one jumpy recruit thumped his stick against his woolen leg. Omar was sick of it. He'd been dreaming of open skies and the steppes, the intimacy of emptiness, endless rivers and the shallow arc of the horizon. It had been 30 years since he'd breathed air so clean a man could detect the hint of a cooking fire an entire valley away. He blamed these fantasies on his grandson, who had been threatening to go home to Urumqi. The young man was spineless but hot-blooded, and these days they avoided each other except to argue. After strolling the neighborhood for a while, Omar settled into a table at his usual haunt, where a bad thing happened. A kitchen boy who had no friends among the other boys, seized by a lunatic scheme to prove himself worthy of their respect, stuck his penis into a steaming bowl of noodles meant for Omar. The other boys made such a ruckus that Omar's guards stormed the kitchen. They hoisted the boy onto a table and pinned him there. Instantly, the restaurant was empty as a windswept plain. Slowly, perhaps with a hint of weariness, Omar rose from his chair. Standing over the boy, he opened a delicate knife shaped like a crescent moon and sliced open the boy's pants. He carved the air above the rubbery nub of flesh and stroked the boy's hairless abdomen, abdomen with his hard fingers, but he felt he was doing it for the benefit of his men, who seemed pleased to have interrupted such an obvious act of disrespect. This sort of thing never used to happen, Omar said. Please, uncle, squealed the boy. Omar was distracted. He needed to eat. What's to be gained by cutting you up? The boy whimpered for mercy. Everyone thinks I've gone soft in the head. This is bad for you, understand? It means that I might have to make an example of you. Uncle, please. Omar looked around at his men, their face those of expectant children. Have you seen that new movie, Omar said? One about those Yakuza? To punish disloyalty, they split it from stem to stern. Urine spurted from the boy and darkened the table. Omar was seized by a sudden and deep sadness, and he turned away in shame. His men made a huge fuss about the piss. This is only a boy, he thought, a boy. Change this one's diaper and send him back to the kitchen, Omar said. Then, to the boy, he said, keep that thing in your pants or you'll lose it. He stroked his cheek with the back of his hand. Bring me another bowl, he said. As a younger man, he would, he would sooner have castrated the boy than spat on the floor. Maybe he was getting soft in his old age, but what was the point of thinking about it? The boy, trembling, one hand clutching the waist of his pants, returned with a fresh bowl of noodles. Omar pressed a 20 yuan note into his palm. He looked carefully at the boy's anguished face into the black waters the boy didn't even know existed within him, and as if a tumbler had fallen in a lock. With a crisp, unbroken motion, Omar cracked him on the side of his head with the knife's ash handle. The boy's lips parted. He wobbled, then dropped to the floor. The other kitchen boys pried the money from his fist and dragged him away, his pants around his ankles, his eyelashes fluttering. It was done, and Omar would not think of it again. Thanks. So I, I love this book. Um, and what really impressed me the most about it when I read it was um, how, just how astutely Jack, I think, um, from my travels there and from reporting and talking to Chinese people over the years, penetrated uh, Chinese culture, the Chinese psyche, um, you know, in, insofar, as, um, insofar as I know anything about it anyway. And um, I mean, I, I want to say that each story is, in a way, it's it's kind of act of uh, ventriloquism, but that that almost makes it sound like you are talking through them. And I think what's so great about these stories is it really feels like it's just these people talking. So, you know, that's an amazing accomplishment considering 
um, how different a universe they inhabit, as a lot of these stories describe. You know, a Uyghur gangster in um, you know in Western China. We have um, other characters that Jack writes about. Uh, include a glass engineer who's building Mao's sarcophagus, um, an old washed up journalist, um, sort of a nouveau riche entrepreneur who's ha- struggling inside of his own family to adjust, to figure out how to adjust to their new wealth. So maybe you can just talk for a minute about um, when you were there, what you did when you were there, where you went, you know, who you spent time with, and how you got such a panoramic view. Okay. <laughs> um. I I went to China in 1994, uh, and actually, it was about this time, t- exactly 20 years ago. I had spent the summer interning here, not in this store, but in DC. Uh, I had just turned 20, and I was impressionable. And I got off the plane in Beijing and had never seen anything like this in my entire life. I grew up in a small town in South Carolina. I went to a small college in North Carolina. Um, it, it, it absolutely was unlike any experience I had ever had in my life. I had been to Europe. I had been to the former Eastern Bloc. Um, I didn't speak any Chinese when I got to China. That was the whole point. I was supposed to go and immerse myself, and I did. I didn't do it as well as some other people. Um, I don't know that I hung out with anybody who was uh, particularly nefarious. I hung out with other students who were invariably kind, open people. Um, but we did, uh, this story is a case in point, uh, spend a lot of time in Uyghurville, where gangsters did rule, and the PSB rolled up and down the street looking threateningly at everybody. Um, I then came back to the States in 95. I went back briefly in 97 and haven't been back since. So the book is largely an act of nostalgia, I think. And I think had I been able to go back and forth more often, I would have possibly written a nonfiction account, but I didn't have access, so I had to make it up. And I think a lot of what you're talking about is just that fictional trick and the necessity of a piece that, that, that a piece of fiction requires of you of writing convincingly from the standpoint of someone other than yourself, um, which I hope I have done. And did you did you start having the ideas for these while you were there and meeting people and you know you met someone who maybe obviously himself was not the glass engineer who designed the sarcophagus for Mao but somebody with a kernel of experience that planted the seed or did most of this occur to you after you'd come back and just began the act of imagination here? Yeah, I, th- it's it's a mix of things. A couple of the stories are actually based on things that I saw or heard while I was there. Um, a couple of them are from news reports that I read. I picked up the crystal sarcophagus just wandering around on the internet trying to read about China. Um, uh, I might have actually seen something on Wikipedia about it. And then I dug in and oh my god. The, the oral histories of that are all in this beautifully revolutionary tone. These guys, you know, however many years later, are still so proud of the work they did building Mao's sarcophagus uh, under these extreme conditions. I like, you can't not write about that. Um, I do think there's a fantastic nonfiction book still to be written about it, and I think Janet Malcolm should do it, uh, because it's everything you deal with in China when you're doing research strains the boundaries of fact it's almost impossible to know, uh, even more so than when you're talking to, if you and I were talking, I would generally trust what you say to me, but there would always be a question, because we do lie to each other. Uh, When the Chinese government gets involved, it's a completely different ballgame, and that adds an interesting level of tension, as far as I'm concerned. Um, But so some of them came from personal experiences, some came from news stories and others, were just 
bizarre dreams I had that I thought might be worth investigating. <laughs> Do you feel like those dreams and, and the imaginings you're having here, um, you know, building those characters are um, similar or parallel or related to the concerns that contemporary Chinese fiction is dealing with? And sort of how do you think what is happening now in China is different <clears throat> from the questions you're asking? That's a really good question. Um, I don't read contemporary Chinese fiction in Chinese, so it's hard for me to get an accurate assessment. I read, <clears throat> you know, I read Yu Hua in translation, um, uh, ha Jin, who's not he's writing about a bygone age in a way. Um, you know, my my favorite Chinese writer is Chen Ruoxi, who wrote a book of short stories about the Cultural Revolution that were published, I think, in '78 in English. So she essentially got these things out as soon as it was possible to get them out. And th that, I think I'm backwards looking <clears throat> because I feel like in order to know anything about China today, you've got to be there. Um, I, tried, I tried a story or two in here that are set in contemporary China. And they are the stories that are the closest to my life. Um, they couldn't have functioned uh, as fictions anywhere other than China. I couldn't have set them in Connecticut, for instance. But the closer we get to the present, the less I know about the country. I am so far from an expert on China. I'm an expert on my experience there, um, which is the protective shield I get to use because I'm writing fiction and not nonfiction, mm -hmm. I, I think. <laughs> Why is I mean, as somebody who, as I've never lived in China myself either, but I've I've been more recently and reading the book, I wouldn't I wouldn't have guessed. You know, the the projection is very is very successful. I think. T tell me, um, you know, who you read that helped um, conceptualize Chinese characters for you. You know, contemporary or um, you know, going back, Chinese writers you've really admired over the years is, you know, did you, did you read Lu Xun and realize, you know, I have to set my stories in China or what? No. Yeah. Um, I, you know, when I realized I was over my head and doing this thing, uh, embarking on an enterprise of writing Chinese uh, stories set in China with predominantly Chinese characters, I actually got very nervous about reading Chinese fiction because I didn't want the influence. Th this is a, I'll chalk this up to a Southern upbringing. If there's something I don't like, I just look the other way and pretend it doesn't exist. So I, I didn't want to steal too much from Chinese fiction. So I, I read a lot of Chinese nonfiction. And the, the book that probably had the biggest influence on the characterizations in here is one called Chinese Lives that is a Studs Terkel-esque, I mean, he wrote the intro to the book, actually, as I recall. Um, uh, it's interviews with people on the street uh, in, the, in the 80s around China. And it is fantastic stories. Um, if they've got it here, I would say fight each other to buy a copy of it if you haven't already read it, because it's really, um, that that's probably there. There is one character in this book who is based, at least in his work, on a character in that book. But otherwise, I, I'm very I'm very nervous about influence and stealing, and I know that I do it accidentally. Uh, but you know, the way I learned to characterize was reading Toby Wolf and Ray Carver and you know Joan Didion and. American folks, I guess. Uh -huh. Well, the question of, of theft is interesting. I mean, to write about um, another culture from, um, you know, in, in some ways outside of that culture is, is I mean, it's, it's difficult and it's, it's a vexed proposition. I was reading up on um, Kipling before I came here, and I think he, um, you know, he does a, a very good job in some cases of writing Indians very sympathetically, and he spent, you know, the first five years of his life in, in Bombay, in Mumbai, and um, 
and, uh, and, and writing their British overlords quite unflatteringly at certain points as well, and is still accused, uh, Orwell wrote that he was um, a prophet of imperialism. So, um, I mean, I don't think this book is anything like that, but maybe you can talk to me a little bit about how you, um, how you navigate the challenge of writing sort of as a white American, you know, from behind the eyes of people whose cultural idiom, as the stories really show, are quite different from ours. You know, where does, where, where does cultural anthropology go into cultural tourism, and, you know, is that even a useful distinction? Yeah, first off, I want a T-shirt that says that. I don't like yeah. cultural. <laughs> um, Here's what I, here's what I think. A good piece of fiction unflinchingly tells the truth. It also involves a, a, an element of risk. If there's no risk, there's no tension. It's probably not going to be interesting to read. The first stories I wrote in this book, I was absolutely terrified that the fact-checking police were going to come after me for getting one little thing wrong. I spent more time checking train schedules for the time for, for the dog, the title story, than I care to admit. Um, there is a stamp <clears throat> in the, the story called The Crystal Sarcophagus that two of the characters put on letters that they send to each other because the letters are read by the authorities, uh, you know, by the government, of course, and so they can only spout Maoisms in the letters, but they communicate with each other by this stamp, which has specific meaning to them. I had to make sure the stamp was actually in publication, was being printed at the time that they would have been mailing it back and forth. It was. And if it, if it weren't, I probably would have picked a different stamp and had to tear down the story and start over. I, I, I was that concerned about it. That's just the detail work, though. I, I, you're asking a much, a much more complicated question that I can only answer by saying that I think in order to write fiction, you've got to have enough, you have to give yourself enough freedom to write absolutely anything. Um, Styron famously got in trouble for doing this. But you have to take the risk and you put it out in the world and then if you got it wrong, you take your lumps. Um, I, I, you do everything you can not to, but to me, you know, the essential human dignity is the, is, is the same. Um, and what kept me interested in a lot of these stories were the differences, though, and trying to get it right in my own mind. Um, but yeah, it really, I really do think, I, I think it comes down to risk and a willingness to take risk. And I think it's worth risking something. I'm writing a novel right now set in New York in the 70s. Man, I, you know, the number of things I could get wrong there and I will get wrong and am getting wrong, but that's what keeps it interesting, you know? You, you swing and you miss and you miss and you miss and occasionally you connect, so. Do you think that's inherent in fiction, generally, even the best? I think it's... There's a lot of missing. Uh, for me, it is. I don't think, yeah. for, I don't think for really good writers. <laughs> it, it, you know, I, I think the, the willingness to, to swing, you have to be willing to take the chance because also, I mean, frankly, it, it's a huge investment of time to put a book in front of someone and for them to read it. You know, they're taking a risk, too, and I guess they can walk away from it, but most people who read care enough to stick with it for 50 pages. And there needs to be tension there and some drama, and the tension needs to, to come from something deeper than just the structure. And I think if you're taking a risk as a writer, that's where that tension can come from. So I think, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's there in almost every piece of good fiction I've ever read. Talking about risk, maybe you can tell me about the financial risk of, uh, you have a couple stories in the book that are, are pretty tough depictions of the way ethnic minorities in China, specifically Uyghurs, but also some other, some other groups are treated by the majority Han Chinese. And um, China's a very large market. <laughs> um, you know, are there any plans to try to get it published there, translated, anything like that? I, yeah, I, I think I'm doomed. I, yeah. That's not going to happen. Um, it, it's interesting. The Chinese government has has a, a, a peculiar approach 
to what they'll let in and what they won't. I I think for exact I I think the Uyghur depictions that seals the deal. It's not going to be it's not going to be published in China. It might be published in Hong Kong. Um, but you know the other thing, the other thing is that I didn't write it for a Chinese audience. Had I been writing for a Chinese audience, I'm not sure I would have approached it in quite the same way. I think I took a little more care to make sure that an American reader who doesn't know China really well could still follow the story. Um, and and so, you know, I, I wrote the Chinese audience off long before uh, I, I wrote that story about the bad, bad PSB. Even if it's not relevant, I wonder what you think about some American authors, uh, famously a historian last year, extracted major parts of his uh, post-war Chinese history to get it published in translation and did very well financially because That's of tough. it. That's tough. That's a really hard question to answer. Um, I grappled with that when I read about it, and I'm still grappling with it. I, I don't know, Adam. I mean, what would you do? I'm serious. I mean, you're you're a noted journalist, and the truth matters. And would you excise something from a book to have it published in a certain market? I think as a as a journalist, especially for a regime in a country that treats the press and the truth as dispensable, I think it would be very very difficult to justify that. Um, but you know, also I don't. I don't have a book on the line. It's easy, you know. It's easy for me to be an armchair yeah. writer here. Um, well, I think that's admirable. I think that's the right answer. But I, I'll say I no. I would. I would. God. <laughs> yeah. I should be so lucky as to have to make that decision. I. I would hope that I would not excise anything. It would either be yes or no because you know I. I, I don't know. I, I didn't. I didn't write that to please the Chinese authorities. I mean, they didn't even come into the equation, but if I can be haughty and say, you know, uh, <laughs> that's... <laughs> um, one thing that I think is of uh, particular interest to Washingtonians is how you managed to write a very nice book while holding down a, ser a very serious person day job. Um, we want to talk about sort of your writing process and sure. what you do and yeah, how you sure. do it and when. Sure. Um, so, so Adam and I know each other uh, from Newsweek. Uh, where we suffered together, and we both moved on to other things since then. Um, but I have a, a standard day job now. Yeah, it's nine to five. But what I do in order to write is I get up about four or four thirty because I have a two-year-old as well, uh, and and it's a race against time to get out of the bed before her. So I try to write between four and six or six thirty, and sometimes I can bleed a little more time out of it. Um, and it's good. It's good to be on deadline. Fiction writers could use deadlines more often, I think. And, and if I, I know that if I don't get it done in the morning, it's not going to get done. Because even if I had time at work, I can't summon the right kind of concentration at work. The phone might ring. Somebody might want something. And, and I get a fair amount of work done on the weekend. But, you know, that's probably uh, why it took me 10 years to write this. All 226 pages of it. That is... Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, snails come in faster than that, right? They say about they say about successful bands, you know, they have 25 years to to do their first album and one year to do their second. <laughs> so, get ready. That's a schedule I'm on, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, with that, I want to open it up to questions uh, from the audience. So, does anybody want to ask about writing this book? Here we go. Sorry, I'm so I was I visited China a couple of years ago as part of a project I was working on and, and I visited Ghana and I visited Brazil as part of the project. And I found of the three cultures, emotionally China was a harder to access. I mean you have the complications of language and and alphabet. But I wonder if by having that time of You've had the two visits, but you have the gift of time plus the immersion, whether it allowed you to explore the Chineseness in yourself in terms of one-to-one -one individuals, because we experience such a sense of otherness with Chinese culture 
and you know the impenetrable but the difference so I wonder in terms of this immersion if you were able to kind of feel this kind of mirroring or sense of Chineseness in yourself that's a really good question um, I have always thought that I, I, I think I said I, I grew up in a small town in South Carolina uh, in a it was an insular world it was family based it was uh, it was a matriarchy, which is not necessarily parallel to to China, but the familial stuff, the uh, the the joke was the worship of ancestors, <laughs> uh, was similar to me. I think I recognized that very quickly. Um, what? Wow. I think the the gift of of retrospect certainly helped here, but I I don't know I don't know if I am capable of identifying any Chinese ness in myself. The the more I read about, I mean one of the problems for me is reading about China. You know it's like reading about America. There you know it is not a monolithic place. Um, there are. <coughs> certain things that we've heard about China over and over again that we, you know, chew over and, and begin to take as uh, wisdom that might apply to the culture as a whole. Um, but the more I read about it and having read about it for 20 years and studied it and read academic papers, uh, fiction, poetry, oral histories, everything I can get my hands on, I, I, I know less and less about it every year and I, I wonder if that's not the same uh, ratio for my knowledge of the United States as well you know the older I get the less I know I am less and less sure of everything <laughs> um, but I think it's very interesting that you know the the Chinese presence I just thought, thought you were going somewhere else with your question the Chinese presence in Ghana and Brazil is uh, important these days uh, that must have been a really interesting trip that you took. <laughs> My name is Dolma, and uh, I'm a Tibetan. Uh, not supposed to be asking questions, but anyway, uh, now since it's a very modern world now, that uh, have you ever thought about? You know, because you guys are so gifted with so many talents uh, to bridge the gap. You know, I know we have said so many bad things about China, which I'm not disagree. So it's you know, mean like our own country here, and I'm from India, and you know what not. But now, because no matter what, the big businesses, like especially if our country is a capitalist, the United States, that they need invest, uh, investment uh, will be based on honesty and hard work and all. And the Chinese people, I had uh, admired ever since I came to this country when I worked in the hotel, how nicely they work and they never bother and never steal and you know stuff like that. So also I kind of noticed that, uh, you know, and also I miss uh, myself being an Asian, that uh, no matter what, you know, how negative the forces would be, I think that China will have an edge as a positive, you know, for the uh, big bucks. So have you uh, noticed that, or did you feel something like that, or would you be looking forward to shepherd, so to speak, the world citizen now? Because it's all biotechnology and all that, right? It's so saddening, and I mean, I feel sad for the, you know for everybody, but I don't have much power or whatever, but I am a kind of journalist, so mm -hmm. I'm just sharing my thoughts, and I hope you guys I, will build on you it. You know, I, that's all I'm doing here, too. I, I think we are... I, m <laughs> I'm philosophically predisposed to believe that we are acted on by forces that over which we have no control and we are in a constant state of trying to convince ourselves that we have control and I think that belief is shot through this book and you know it, it, the book itself is meant to be a conversation with a reader and not to be, not not to sum it up in a firework but I think that's what it comes down to it's conversation and you know kindness to one another <laughs>
you, Jack. Hey. A um, couple questions, quick questions. One is, did you work on any of these stories uh, in tandem simultaneously as you were mm -hmm. going through them or do them one at a time? Mm -hmm. And also, in writing a collection of short stories, were there essentially when do you know that the collection is complete and that it's not missing some piece? <laughs> you don't. It's <laughs> um, a good question. I don't, I, I, you know, I didn't work on any in tandem. The last story in the book <coughs> was the first one I ever tried to write and it cumulatively took me 14 years to write it, uh, but I was not working on it alongside any of the other stories. I, I tend to to go one at a time and try to put all my focus and all my energy on one. Um, and how do you know when you're done? I, I think it's the same for everything. It's like you're, you're done when you can't put up with it anymore, when you're sick of it and you just want to get it out of the house. Um, that said, this, this collection, I knew I was done when I finished that story that I had started 14 years earlier because I had taken so many wrong turns with it. I had tried to write two novels based on the first four pages of it. They had both failed. I had tried to write three short stories that had all failed. And finally, I made myself look at what it was really about, and I was done, and I felt it. So I don't think that's ever going to happen again. I think it's going to revert for everything after this to just get away, like I can't deal with you anymore. <laughs> what about sequentially or simultaneously? Um, yeah, no, they're all sequential. Yeah. S yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, you said something uh, uh, in passing how this story couldn't have taken place in Connecticut or something like that, or mm -hmm. these stories couldn't mm -hmm. have. I was listening to the story you read. I thought a little bit about that of a mafia don walking through Little Italy, mm -hmm. maybe with some variation that might have worked or not. But mm -hmm. I'd like you to elaborate on why the stories that you've written um, had to be in China. What what is the Chinese ness of these stories compared to, say, the world you you, know, you grew up in? It's a great question. It, it, it I don't mean to give you an evasive answer, um, and I'll try to keep it brief as well. When I wrote the first one of these, uh, when I wrote the dog, the title story, the dog. <laughs> I approached it only because I felt at that time I had finally gotten enough control over my language to be able to handle the material that I wanted to work with. Um, it f interested me intellectually and it interested me emotionally in a way that nothing else I was working on did. I have set stories in San Francisco, I've set stories down south. They all come from a different place in me. And this it was important to me that the story not, that you couldn't just change the, the title, you couldn't just change the characters' names, and you couldn't change the city that it was set in and have it still work. There needed to be something that was essentially Chinese about all of these stories. Uh, as to what that essential Chineseness is, mainly it's that outside force I was referencing with her question. There is an absurd amount of pressure that is exerted on the populace in China, I think, that comes from not just the government, but it's a, a certain kind of familial pressure, the filial piety, all of this stuff that is very interesting to me because it's unfamiliar. Uh, and it's an intellectual challenge to try to grapple with that and and turn that into a story. Um, I tend to veer in absurdist directions when I write fiction, and there is no end of absurd things happening in China today. So that attracts me greatly. I, and I realize I still I still haven't really answered your question. It's a really good question. Because I don't know what the essential Chineseness is. It's the, I don't know, it's the aura of the story. Um, I hope, I genuinely hope that it's more than just the setting, the people. I hope there's something that's in the deep structure that, that required it to have been set in China, because that's how it felt to me when I wrote it. Thank you, that's a great question. 
preface this by saying it's a bit of a selfish question. Uh, I just uh, spent the past eight years living in the mainland. Uh, I got back like a few weeks ago. Oh, wow. Uh, and where, where were you? Uh, everywhere except for Xinjiang and depending on who you ask, Taiwan. Wow. Uh, uh, and at the end of this month, I'm starting an MFA in fiction at, at Purdue. <laughs> uh, and I'm planning on writing about contemporary You want to strangle me now? <laughs> this was, did I write your book? <laughs> we can talk later if you want. Uh, 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 so this is why it's a selfish question. I, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned about how, you, maybe not intentionally, but you had sort of excluded a Chinese audience, whatever that means, but that, that you were wrote, writing specifically for a set audience, maybe? I, yeah, I, I think for, for an American audience, yeah. 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 So I, I'm, curi I'm curious about your process for that, like if how you like uh, adjusted or reworked your work uh, based on the feedback of like agents and like mm -hmm. editors and the whole like literary sort of machine up in New York. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've I have uh, friends who've written books about and set in China, um, and they've always talked about a sort of pushback in terms of like, oh, this is too complex. You have to really like simplify, simplify. So I just wanted to know if there's any things you, you know, I the the I think my experience was that I was so so concerned about it being digestible for an for an American audience for an audience that was not familiar with you know the Gunjaco market or whatever that I, my first reader is an American novelist I send things to him he sends them back and, and flags anything that that stands out to him um, by the time the stories would get to magazines or I mean you know maybe that's why some of the magazines rejected them they were too Chinese I actually heard that from an editor at the New Yorker years and years ago she said this is a lovely story but it might be a little too Chinese I was like, well, what the hell does that mean yeah. I, I, you know it's a kind way of saying we don't want your story is what it means <laughs> um, by the time this got into book form uh, I was very lucky to be dealing with people who wanted the book and they didn't ask me to to rework anything because of the this the subject matter they only had tweaks to language and to structure and very minor ones at that um yeah i i, I that's I, I i think i think i had uh i think i had good luck but but again, you know, it's I, I don't know that I could write any other way other than for an American audience. You know, American fiction is what's in my head. I, I don't I don't think in terms of I, I don't think the story in Chinese and then translate it into to English. I was kind of embarked on something that that was um you know much more American to begin with. So it it was not so much a matter of tempering it for the Chinese for for an American audience as just doing what I already do. I think. Hey, well, good luck. That's congratulations on the program. I, w <clears throat> I was struck by what you said that the more you know and the more you read, the realize the less you know. Uh, when I first went to China 35 years ago, and there was very little to read about China then, but the people would say that if you went to China for six weeks, you wrote a book. If you went for six months you write a magazine article and if you went for six years you didn't write anything <laughs> and and i'm curious but now we have this huge outpouring of literature both fiction and nonfiction, about china and i'm puzzled whether you have found any of it that you think does provide valuable and valid insights i i do i, I you know i love peter hessler's stuff um I think the the stuff that's coming into translation, um, I, I, you know, uh, Ma Jian uh, wrote a very short book that came out a few years ago called "Stick Out Your Tongue," that is a beautiful piece of what you would call subversive Chinese fiction, but really it's just beautiful fiction. Um, you know, a, as far as American writers go, though I like Osnos, but for me, it, uh, Peter Hessler is really the one who he gets it right. 
but also what do I know? You know, I wasn't there for six years, um, which I think is an interesting tension in, in this interpretation of China. You know, we all think we know. You know, how could we? D do you have an answer yeah. to that question? I did think that uh, Evan Osnos' book was very good. Um, I think that the John Pomfret book was very good. I don't know if you read that or not. Uh, it's about his going back after 20 years and what the changes he saw in his classmates. I thought the book written by, I can't remember his name, Rick, the, who, the NPR correspondent, mm -hmm. uh, was traveling across China. And I do agree with uh, Peter Hessler as being the first choice. Have you written one? No, and I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. You've been too much. You've been, yeah. um, I've been uh, reading some contemporary um, fiction mm -hmm. about China. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and an author that I would recommend is Qiu Xiaolong. Qiu Xiaolong. Qiu Xiaolong. In fact, his first book, uh, was uh, so re well received that Harvard is using it in their MBA Introduction to China program. And it's fiction? It's a fiction. Oh, great. It's a mystery, you know, but it is so well written. The, re the reason that I find them extremely genuine, and I am Chinese and I've lived in China, mm -hmm. and I know a lot about Chinese culture, I find his book uh, very authentic because he manages to capture um, something that that gentleman referred to over here somewhere. Uh, I mean, his stories absolutely could not be transported somewhere else. Um, you know, when you read his story, you know this is real, <laughs> this is real. <laughs> and, and that's why they are so powerful. Um, you know, I have to say that having gone to Xinjiang, not to say that I know everything about Uyghurville and all that, but um, I do believe that the story you read to us, although extremely compelling, um, probably if you wanted to have some Chineseness in it, you may have wanted to put a little bit more of the cultural stuff in there. Mm -hmm. um, you, you did a good job describing and all that, Thank and you. it's very good, it's very compelling. Um, but I have to say, being Chinese, I didn't hear that much that was real Chinese in it. But Chu Xiaolong, I definitely recommend that. He's read quite a few of these novels, contemporary. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this is yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions? <laughs> 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 no. Well, oh yeah, we do. Uh, thank you very much. Hi. I enjoyed okay. the reading and the discussion. Uh, a lot of the discussion has been around this idea of this essential Chineseness or this essentialness of a culture. Is you, as writers and you know thinking about these things, do you think as we become because of information technology or access? to uh, being able to travel so much more and that type of thing. Do, do you think cultures are losing their essentialness and we in some ways are being watered down and you know, all getting gapified or something like that? No. <laughs> um, no, and I'll, I also don't know. Um, I, <laughs> I, think, I, I, I think it would be impossible to water down or change the essential Chineseness. Th this is a term we're using in this class now. None of us really know what it means. Um, least of all me. Uh, nothing. Nothing is going to water down the essential Chineseness of of mainland China. Um, <laughs> he's got the biggest smile on his face. <laughs> it's like not possible. Um, and it's not just because of nationalism, and it's not just a cultural thing. I I, I think. 
you know, we are all who we are, and I can blather on endlessly, but I won't. Um, I think China is firm. I'll say that. Uh, I have time for one other question, if there is one. No? Well, with that, we'll say thanks to Jack. Thank you all.